The senator from Oklahoma. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I've been listening in my office for the last several hours to the debate. Uh, and I think there's one thing that really hadn't been brought out in the debate. <clears throat> when Washington says it's going to cut spending, it's untruthful with the American public. Because both the Boehner bill and the Reid bill increase discretionary spending over the next 10 years by one of them 830 billion and the other 832 billion. How is it that we can, with a straight face in this body, talk about <clears throat> a cut when in fact we're going to, and CBO says we're going to actually increase the spending in the discretionary counts over the next 10 years nearly a trillion dollars. <clears throat> and you've heard the debate in the House, in the Senate, of a spending cut. And of course, that goes to what the heart of the problem is in our country is words get twisted around to the advantage of the politicians, but to the disadvantage of the American citizens. We are in trouble financially. Most people agree with that. We have programs <clears throat> that are in difficult straits. Matter of fact, they're broke. They're not just in difficult straits. Here's the ones that are broke. Medicare Part A trust fund, worst case scenario this year, 2016. That's the fund that solves and pays for hospitalizations for our seniors. Now, <clears throat> we've heard a lot of statements said about Medicare. The average Medicare recipient paid $130,000 into Medicare. The average Medicare recipient takes $350,000 out. How long do you think that can continue? How long can we continue to tell seniors that we can continue a program based on its utilization rates, based on its reimbursement rates, based on the tax rates, that has a $220,000 difference between what goes out in benefits versus what comes in? It's broke. Medicaid's broke. <clears throat> the reason it's broke, because the states are broke trying to take care of it. We mandate what they must do and yet the states are choking on Medicaid. And we're choking on matching the amount of dollars. <clears throat> and under the Affordable Care Act, it is now estimated 25 million more people will go into Medicaid. So it's broke. The census, it was broke before it started. It cost twice what it did 10 years ago. Seven billion, eight billion dollars more than what it was estimated. Fannie and Freddie. We know they're broke. They're $190 billion that you have now committed for to pay to get them out of the hock. Congress created that, $190 billion. And, and that is where we are today. It's going to be three or $400 billion that we have to pay. We will be required to pay. Citizens of this country, Social Security, people say it's not broke. We have $2.5 trillion worth of IOUs. Well, the fact is, is that money's gone. Congress stole it, spent it on other things, and now we lack the ability to go into international financial markets to borrow that money to put that trust fund hold. So why do we need to reform Social Security? So we can make sure it's there in the future. What we do know is in 2032 now, according to the trustees, that everybody on Social Security will only get 77% of what they're promised, and every year after that, it will decline. So that when my kids are on Social Security, they will get about 40% of what the average Social Security recipient gets now. Why would, and we know we can fix it, and we know we can fix it and make it sustainable forever. But we won't do that because that's politically difficult. The U.S. Post Office is bleeding every day, yet we haven't fixed it. We're going to do a gimmick to buy it some time. But the fact is, is we've set it up under a system when, <clears throat> when they negotiate labor contracts under the arbitration system, they can't consider the financial health of the post office. That'd be like paying somebody to mow your grass and saying they'll set the price on it and you can't negotiate what the price is. 
And yet they're going to lose eight to ten billion dollars this year and more every year going forward. And yet we've not fixed it, not done anything. Cash for clunkers, absolute. When you look at the dollars and the home buyer program, new home buyer program, they actually had a negative effect on the economy. That's what the studies show now. So we blew all through all that money. The highway trust fund. What is used to build highways and roads and bridges in our country is broke. We're looking for $13 billion to try to make it whole. And all we did was transfer the last three years to that. Rather than reform it, we didn't do anything about it. <clears throat> the new government-run health care programs. Here's what, what we know is the new studies show that over half of the employers in this country will drop their insurance for the people who presently have insurance at work. Hundreds of billions of dollars of additional taxpayer money are going to be required to subsidize the exchanges that those people are going to go into. Because the penalty for dropping somebody's insurance is economically too low to keep employers from doing that. So we have all these programs that are broke, and we have a discussion about the debt ceiling, but we're not talking about what the real problem is is this government is twice the size it was 10 years ago. Twice as big. And it'd be great if all of it was constitutional. It'd be great if it was all effective. It'd be great if it was all efficient. And it would be great if we could afford it. But the fact is, is we're where we are today with $1.6 trillion deficits because we can't afford the government we have. And so we've not concentrated on the very areas where we can find mutual agreement We've had three bipartisan bills in here where we've cut money, significant money, billion here, five billion here, seven billion here, three billion here, go through the Senate with vast majority votes, only to go nowhere because the allowance for the debate on the underlying bills was stopped. They were bills were pulled. <coughs> so what do we do? Well, the first thing we do is we look at what the problems are. What are the problems? We have a hundred different programs with a hundred sets of bureaucracies for surface transportation alone. Why do we do that? Why haven't we fixed it? That's a question the American people ought to be asking. We have 82 programs to improve the quality of our teachers run by the federal government <clears throat> across seven different agencies. Only one of them is the Department of Education. Why are we doing that? Where's the assessment of how well they work? Where's the metrics to say we should be spending this money in this way because we're getting return? Not one of them has a metric on it. Not one of them's ever been measured of whether or not it's effective. We have 88 economic development programs in four agencies for which we spend $6.8 billion. And we have another 100 economic development programs in six other agencies for which we spend another $4 billion. And not one of them's ever been measured to see does it improve economic activity? And if, in fact, it does, why do we have 188 separate agencies to stimulate economic development? I mean, this isn't complicated stuff. It's common sense. Every American other than the Congress would fix that. We have 56 programs to teach financial literacy to the American people. First of all, I'd question whether or not we ought to be teaching anybody financial literacy as a government when we run so poorly. But if, in fact, we do, why do we have 56? And oh, by the way, not one of them's ever been measured to see if it effectively teaches somebody financial literacy. We have 47 job pro training programs, cost $18 billion a year, nine different agencies, nine different sets of bureaucracies, and all of them but three overlap with the other. That's according to the Government Accountability Office. Why? Why would we do that? We have 18 programs for food for the hungry. That's something we all want to be involved in. 18? Why 18 sets of bureaucracies? How well are they working? Are they effective? Could we do them better? The question hadn't even been asked by Congress. We have homeless programs for both prevention and assistance, 20, six different agencies. So you have 20 different sets of bureaucracies 
that are designed to do the same thing. Disaster response and preparedness inside FEMA alone. Inside FEMA alone, we have 17 different programs. Inside that one agency, which is part of, part of the Department of Homeland Security. I, I ask the question, why? Why hasn't been a priority for us to, to work on those? So what would you do? Would the senator be willing to yield for a question? Or I'd be happy to yield to the senator. Engage in a colloquy. Mr. I'd President, it may, it may surprise the senator. I hope, it, I hope not. Uh, I don't think so, but it might surprise some people listening to this to uh, hear that from this side of the aisle, a lot of us here have enormous respect for what the senator has been talking about and fighting for and what he has achieved. And I might add, he is one of those uh, courageous senators who has come together in the last months, working months as part of the so-called Gang of Six, to try to bridge the gap here and see if we can't find a way forward. And as I listen to him, there's an enormous amount of common sense in the questions that he's asking. These are questions all of us need to join into. And we need to join into them in a process that allows us to be able to fairly and in a balanced way work on the grand bargain, as you call it, the big fix. Now, I'd ask the senator, because I think a lot of Americans listen to this bait. I've been listening to it somewhat on the floor, somewhat back in the office. And I think people have got to be saying to themselves, these guys are kind of talking past each other or something's being missed here. Because you hear things from this side, they sound reasonable. You hear things over here. So people sort of say to themselves, what, what's hanging up this process? Why is the entire country being held hostage here? So I, I, I'd like to ask my colleague if he'd help us kind of bear down on what we need to do here. And, and I'd ask him if it isn't fair and accurate to say that the so-called Gang of Six, terrible name, I think, maybe we call them G6, but came together with an understanding that we needed balance in the approach to satisfy both sides and build a critical mass. And that balance required cuts. You have to put the big items, the big ticket items on the table. That means fixing Social Security, reforming it for the long term, Medicare, Medicaid, unsustainable on the current paths. Defense, we've got to find a handle on some of the procurement and expenditures. But we also, and I think the senator joined in this, have to close some tax loopholes and have tax reform and find some level of revenue and an appropriate ratio that allows us to fix this. And that's where the problem has been, that there are a group of folks over in the House who have just insisted no revenue at all. Well, and, and what I'd ask the senator, isn't it fair to say that the Gang of Six came up with a sort of more balanced approach on which I believe the Senate could find the ground of compromise? What Senator Reid has proposed, I believe, has cuts that the Republicans have supported. Maybe not quite enough yet. So maybe let, we can negotiate let me Let me reclaim my time. Absolutely. There are absolutely no cuts in what either Senator Reid or Le uh, Speaker Boehner proposed into discretionary spending. The spending will rise $832 billion over the next two years, 10 years, in the discretionary accounts. Now, only in Washington is that a cut. And quite frankly, I'm willing to work with my colleagues. I've been out there. I say we have to move and eliminate some of these loopholes that we have to reform the tax code. I'm willing to take the heat from my side on that. I don't have any problem. What I'm not willing to take anymore is a Senate that won't work on the details of the specific problems. And, here, and what I'm trying to do is to outline where the problems are. Where is the lead? And it, we didn't do it when we were in charge either, Senator Kerry. There's been a failure of leadership in this country, in this body, to attack the very problems. When we have 47 job training programs and none of them are working well because that's what we do know, because the very few times they've been looked at, they don't work, and we're spending $18 billion a year and we're not fixing them, we, the American people got to say, what is wrong with you all? 
So what, what we have to do is we have to evaluate the effectiveness of every program of the federal government. We have to limit the overhead costs of federal programs. We've put ideas out there. This is $9 trillion worth of cuts. Not Washington cuts, American cuts. Money you're not going to spend that's less than what we're spending today, not money you're not going to spend that you would have spent more the next year. This is real cuts. Each one of these is in here, backed up by the facts, not biased. You could disagree with where you would make the cuts, but you can't disagree with the facts in here because all the facts come from the Congressional Research Service, the General Accounting Office, the Office of Management Budget, the President's budget in terms of his recommendations and why, and the, and the CBO. We won't go there. My problem with the Senate is we won't do our work. And we're as guilty. I, I don't, this is not partisan to me. Our country's future is at stake. And when we have two bills, one last night and one today, that is, are literally lying to the American people when they say cuts, I think it's unconscionable. And, would, the, would the senator further yield? Well, let, let, let me finish, if I will. I will give you a chance, and I will yield Appreciate back to you in a moment. The fact is, is we won't tell the truth to the American people. And the first truth is, is if we'll be honest with them, they will understand what the necessities that will have to be brought forward to in this country to be able to solve the problems. By denying what the problem is, we will never get the consensus in this country and the embrace of the American people to do what everybody in this body knows is eventually going to have to be done. We will not have a Medicare system that's like the Medicare system we have today in five years. It is absolutely unsustainable. We will never be able to borrow the money to do it. We're going to get a debt downgrade no matter what we do. We will not be able to borrow the money. So rather than continue to be dishonest with the American people about the status of where we are, what we ought to do is embrace them and call for the very things that made this country great. The sacrifice of the citizens of this country to rebuild the potential for our future, to recreate a renewal in our country that embraces the things that made us great. A true free enterprise system with a limited government that will actually allow people to be rewarded for hard work of their own blood, sweat, and toil and get that back and have the government take a fair share of that. On the upside, it should be more. On the downside, it should be less. I agree. The question is, is will we do it? Will we continue a charade to the American people, continuing to tell them we're going to cut $800, $900 billion out of the discretionary budget when, in fact, we're going to increase it $832. There's only $2 billion difference between Senator Reid's plan and, and Speaker Boehner's on discretionary spending, and both of them are untruthful to the American people. Both of them take the American people as a lap. They say, we can wink and nod at you, and we can tell you something that's not true, and we can walk out of here saying we spent less money. Well, you're only going to spend less money than what we planned to spend, which was way too much in the first place, which was totally unsustainable as well. So let's just be honest with them. Our deal is, is we don't have the courage to actually make the cuts that are listed in here. We don't have the courage to eliminate the waste. We don't have the courage to eliminate the duplication. Why? Because every one of these programs has a political backing. And we're politicians. And uh, un uh, and un uh, Unfortunately, too often, we're that instead of statesmen. It's time for us, both sides, to lead this country. To lead the country in a vision of, here's the real truth of our problem. Now let's have a, a debate about what should be the number one priority. How much should we spend on defense? Should we continue to allow contracts that go way overrun? Should we continue to allow requirement creep in contracts not just in defense, in homeland security, in HHS. We have the same problems we have in defense, we have it on all the other big agencies. We buy $64 billion worth of IT every year in this country, and $37 billion of it is wasted. Totally blown. Why? And what have we done about it? Not one thing. Just go look at the high-risk list for the GAO on IT. Every year that happens. The Census Bureau spent $600 million on a device that never worked. There was no penalty for the company that did it. 
We paid it anyhow. It was a cost plus contract. And the reason it never worked is because we had requirement creep all the way through. We don't have any grown-ups making the purchases for this country. Nobody with experience. So we're doing the wrong things at the wrong time. What we need to be doing is the right things at the right time for the right reason, considering that we take, make sure we take care of those that need us to take care of them, and then we demand participation of everybody else. We need to cap the total number of federal employees. Not because we want to, but because we don't have any other choice. And we don't have to let anybody go. Just through attrition, we can downsize the federal government. We waste $15 billion every five years on managing properties in this country that we own that no, we're, no, they're vacant. And yet we're spending that money on them. But we can't get a real property bill through. How, how, how valuable to us is $15 billion? We've got to start paying attention to the pennies and the nickels and the dimes, and we won't do it. Unnecessary government printings, including us. I've been trying to get the elimination of this for three years. There's millions and millions and millions of dollars we can save by not printing the copies of this every day that nobody looks to, except I did see my good friend from Illinois actually look at a vote last night. But he could have got it online out of his Blackberry. The point is, is we're, we're tearing down trees to print paper we don't need. How much time do I have left? The Senator has eight and a half minutes All remaining right. on the Republican side. Mr. President, I, I just asked the Senator again. What I'm trying to do is help us get out of this predicament we've got where we've got a couple of days before the United States defaults. Now, everything the Senator has said is worthy of inquiry, but isn't it true that if we could get, I mean, part of the Reid proposal and the Boehner proposal proposes a joint committee that will be structured somewhat like a base closing commission that will require the Senate and the House to vote in expeditious fashion on these kinds of proposals, whatever the joint committee proposes, and if the joint committee doesn't succeed in proposing something, then hopefully either the Gang of Six or the Simpson-Bowles Commission. So isn't the key now to resolving this crisis and not defaulting our ability to be able to come together on a sufficient trigger or some sufficient mechanism that guarantees we're actually going to deal with the things similar to what the Senator is raising? Well, I would, I would not disagree that those negotiations are going on as we speak. I'm not a party to them. I don't know if you are. I suspect the, 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 the present pro tem is. And we're not going to get to decide that. That's going to come to us for a decision. I don't, look, I worked a long number of months with my colleagues from the other side of the aisle. I put my name on a bill that really doesn't fix it, but it was something to get us moving. It's better than where we are today. I agree with you. But what I would tell you is that's not good enough. We are not good enough yet <clears throat> to where we need to be if we're actually going to solve the problem. Let me just finish going through this. We need to end no-bid contracts in this country. I'll give you a specific example. Before he left here, Senator Lemieux got through the business bill, pre-screening of payments on Medicare payments so that we look, but rather than we pay them and then go chase the fraud, we got through a bill. That required Center for Medicaid Services to put in a program to look to see if they ought to pay the bill. Now what'd they do? They signed a cost plus contract for $77 million with a firm that's never done that before and didn't take a fixed price contract from firms that have already done it before. Tell me how we let that happen. And yet it happened. And when we had testimony in our committee, they said it was a fixed price contract, only to write back and say it wasn't a fixed price contract. We need some common sense in our government. I'll finish this up real quick. We need to disclose the text and cost of legislative, uh, legislation prior to passage. We need to identify gov duplicative government programs. We've done that. That's in here. There's hundreds and thousands of them. 
throughout the federal government. We need to eliminate them. We need to mandate congressional oversight. <clears throat> That's where our leaders, I think, have failed on both sides. They haven't mandated the committee chairman have to do the oversight that's required to solve this month problem. We need to freeze the size of this government. We can't afford the government we have today. The debate is about what will happen in the future. What will be the revenue increases? What will be the spending increases? But nobody's talking about decreasing the size of the federal government. We can't afford this government. We can't afford to continue to spend the money that we're spending. So I'll close with this. If we continue to be less than straightforward with the American people about what we're doing here, about the Reed Bill, just as I, the reason I wanted to debate the Boehner Bill is I wanted to make this point on the Boehner Bill. When we call something a cut of $900 billion, just because the CBO says we're going to spend $900 billion less than what we were planning to spend, but still $832 billion more than what we are spending now, that's not a cut anywhere except in Washington. And we ought to admit it. If, if that's the best we can do, the American people need to know that's the best we can do. But we can't play the games anymore. I, I have another colleague, I think, that would like to speak, and with the remaining time, I would yield to him. Is the senator from Alaska interested in speaking?